Good. So growing up, I was one of those high energy kids just going, going, going. I might have been diagnosed ADD, ADHD, had there been such a thing in my day. In my day, they were just called, you know, bratty kids. So that was kind of my diagnosis. A few years back, I got what has been referred to as the box. The box is mom and dad's collection, mostly mom's collection, of all the little things that, cute little things that you did while growing up. You know, the artwork that you had and little uh, projects and, and things that you made with clay uh, when you were a kid. Also in the box is the list of and collection of report cards from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. So, uh, any of you ever gotten the box before from your parents? Uh, it's a, it's a pretty common thing, although I don't think we have a box for our kids, probably because they weren't that smart or that ta talented or created, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> That's right. They're not here today, so I can say that, huh? <laughs> so I was looking through the box. Uh, I've actually looked at it a couple of times just to go down uh, memory lane. And I was particularly looking at the report cards. And I was a very average student. But in uh, kindergarten through sixth grade, well, I think they started doing letter grades maybe in fifth or sixth grade, something like that. But there would always be a place for comments that the teachers would, would give uh, about you, the student, uh, for the report card. And I'm not kidding, almost every single year growing up, there was some version of this statement. Barry is smart enough. He just needs to slow down and not rush. And boy, I tell you, that is so true. As a child, playtime was what I was always rushing toward. I didn't enjoy school. I didn't enjoy chores. But I really liked my playtime. So I was one of those kids that would actually go to school early so that I could have some playtime with my friends. Um, I would rush through my classroom assignments because I was anxious to be the first one in line to get out onto recess and lunch hour. Uh, after school, I would rush through my homework so that I could go play with my friends. Uh, I would rush through my chores. I was just going, going, going. And even in my playtime, I found that I was sort of quickly bored and would be moving from activity to activity. I wasn't one of those kids that could just sit and, and do one thing uh, for for you know, an entire afternoon. It was always changing around. Playtime was really designed to help keep boredom at arm's length because all those other things were immediately boring, things like school and chores and all that kind of thing. And then as a teenager, boredom was no longer the thing that I was dreading, the thing that I was avoiding. As a teenager, now it was really becoming much more about my insecurities, that that was the thing that was you know, driving my decisions and my choices, and specifically the insecurities of being accepted, of feeling like I belonged in the group, and whether or not I was competent, capable, adequate, smart enough, all that kind of stuff, you know? These three things were the driving force behind everything I did. It was to resolve one or all of these things that had to do with my playing sports, learning to play a guitar, uh, the friends I chose, the hurry I was in to get the driver's license, because with the driver's license, there was a better likelihood that I could get the girl, you know what I mean? And that the decision to get the girl was about these insecurities. Uh, losing the girl was about these insecurities. It's why I abused drugs and alcohol as an adolescent. And from an early age, I mean a very early age, I realized this about my life, that it was largely characterized by this thing called dissatisfaction. And I suspect I'm not the only one in the room who has struggled with this. We are creatures who are prone to dissatisfaction. I mean, we are dissatisfied because we're married. We're dissatisfied because we're single. We're dissatisfied with our money. You're dissatisfied with your body. You're dissatisfied with your boss, with your hairline, your waistline, your bottom line. The neighbors, you're dissatisfied. You're dissatisfied with your dog, with your cat. Well, maybe not your dog, but everything else. Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, they said it well. I can't get no satisfaction. And of course, 
We know that as we grow and mature in our relationship with Jesus, our longings are satisfied and our dissatisfaction becomes more and more a point of satisfaction. But the reality is we're not that much different than we were as children. We are impatient. We want what we want and we want it now. now. That's right. And so toward pushing and pursuing for that satisfaction, here's what we do is we turn to turn to our little gods to get the satisfaction. And that is what the Bible actually calls idolatry, which is what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks, a new series starting today. Uh, we're going to look at this because whether you know it or not, we have these little gods. We have some idolatry in our life. And they are what absolutely diminish our relationship with Jesus and keep us from the ultimate satisfaction and joy that God wants us to have in our life. It is a big deal in the Bible. Both Old Testament and New Testament are filled with so many stories about God's people, particularly ancient Israel, about turning to idols. I mean, I think it's actually mentioned more than any other sin that's out there is this sin of idolatry. John Calvin was absolutely correct, th reformer uh, theologian who said, the human heart is an idol factory, constantly latching on to things we think we must have for joy and happiness. So much of our behavior ends up being driven by our idols. And the key writers in the New Testament, I mean, every single one of them speak to this. And there aren't many subjects that we could say of that in terms of things that set us back and that hold us back and that, you know, are basically summarized in the category of some kind of a sin. All the New Testament writers speak to this. For example, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, therefore, my friends, flee from idolatry. John, the Apostle John says, dear children, keep yourself from and then Peter says, be anxious to do the will of God. Verse 3 of chapter 4, you have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy, like sex sin, like lust, like getting drunk, wild parties, drinking bouts. You know, I was so tempted to want to talk about the difference between getting drunk and drinking bouts, but I'm going to have to do that on another subject. And finally, the worship of Okay, And then James, although he doesn't actually use the word, the context of this is actually about the idol of money. It says, your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Verse 3, your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. I want you to remember those words, eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last day. And so when you read the Old Testament as well, you're never too far away from God dealing with the sin of idol worship among his people, Israel. It's probably not surprising that idolatry is addressed in the Ten Commandments. In fact, of the top ten, it is, in fact, number one and two. We're all familiar with this, Exodus 20. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven or above on the, or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I am the Lord your God, and I'm a jealous God. And we'll come back to that. Uh, but it's fascinating to me that when I read this, it's fascinating to me that Israel even need to be told this because, I mean, this command, it seems so, well, it's just interesting to me that here's a people who are witnessing miracles every single day. I mean, this is spoken to a people who walked through on dry ground the parted Red Sea. This is a group of people who are provided water to drink that are coming out of rocks. This is a people who have manna rain down from heaven for food six days a week. This is a people who are continuously led during the day by this cloud that comes from the, the, the presence of God by day, and then at night the cloud becomes a pillar of fire, and they lived in that context every single day. Now why in the world they would be turning to a little God is puzzling to me, 
They had so much evidence that God was with them, and yet he issues this command. And you know why? Because Calvin was right, that it is in the human fallen heart to be an idol factory. And indeed, God is a jealous God. He insists on being God, and he insists on that being exclusive. He doesn't share that role with any other God, even in a partnership where he might be assigned a senior partner. No, he wants to be God and God alone. So just to begin this series and to lay out some introductory principles and we'll get into the thick of things next week, let's just clarify a definition. So when we talk about idolatry, what is idolatry? Well, it is anything more fundamental than God. Fundamental meaning at the basis, uh, as a foundation. Anything more fundamental than God to your happiness, meaning in life, self-worth, significance, sense of security, value, or identity. That's kind of a starting point. We might also say anything we love more than Jesus Christ. Additionally, I might add, anything we view as more important than Jesus Christ. And finally, anything we turn to for our needs that Jesus alone can satisfy. So it could be almost anything that can become an idol. Your money can become an idol, you know, your checkbook balance, your IRAs, your 401ks, your investments of all different kinds. Your possessions can become idols. Your homes, cars, toys, your collections, your career can become an idol where that's where you find all your significance and all of your personal value and worth and in your career. It can even be idols that are, I just categorize this as relational, where romantic love can become an idol, admiration of others can be an idol, the respect of others can be an idol, the need to be needed can be an idol, the need to be taken care of can become an idol, being the life of the party and carrying that kind of persona could become an idol because that's what makes you feel significant. Even extreme shyness could become an idol. You know what? You'll think better of me if I just hide in the shadows, never open my mouth, never share an opinion, never contribute to a conversation. You'll think better of me. So my self-worth goes up by playing this shy role. By the way, as a professional mental health people, to all the shy people, I would tell you, here's a thought, get over it. Because that is not your identity. It is not your personality. It's absolutely rooted in your insecurity. I don't think God created people and said, listen, you all have a voice. You all have an opportunity to use that brain I gave you to weigh in and to problem solve together as a team. But there's a handful of you where, you know, really, I don't really, there's nothing upstairs for you to contribute, so it's okay for you to be quiet. I don't think our Heavenly Father rolls that way with any of his creation. But anyway, I digress. That's another sermon. Experiences can be an idol, like hobbies, adrenaline rush activities, having the spotlight, avoiding the spotlight, experiences. Habits can certainly become idols, our drug and alcohol use, uh, pornography, food, shopping, gambling, exercise, almost anything. Here's another thing I'd like you to know about idols, is that they certainly can be immoral, like you know, porn and affairs and all that kind of stuff. But they can also be things, in fact, I think for most in the Christian community, they're actually good things that we turn into idols. So, you know, having a career and feeling good about your career, nothing wrong with that. Having money, lots of money, nothing wrong with that. Having romantic love, I pray all of you enjoy that. Having homes, cars, even some toys. But when we begin to look at the created thing in the same way that we would, should be looking to the creator, now we have a problem. And so regarding this idle tendency of ours on the things that are actually inherently good, you know what, uh, what Augustine in the fourth century was really one of the first guys to come along who was kind of a thinker about Christian theology. And on this subject of idolatry, here's what he called it. He called it disordered love. St. Augustine in the 4th century. What he meant by that is that our love is out of order. In other words, if you love things that, you know, one, two, three, four, that if you love things that should be like fourth on the list, 
but you've elevated it to second on the list or first on the list, then it begins to create all kinds of problems. So, you know, again, should you love your career? Yeah. Should you love your spouse? Of course. Your family? Of course. But love that is disordered, when we love but do so in a disordered way, when you love your career more than your family, it becomes a problem. You know, career should be somewhere, in my estimation, below it should be below marriage and family. Amen? You know, keeping things in their right order. Um, so yeah, we can love good things, just not supremely, just not first. And we do well to use wisdom and description about where actually in the pecking order of things these kind of things should be. I remember years ago I had an office in, uh, uh, in the Bay Area in this community I worked in. It was like the epitome of, you're familiar with the phrase yuppie? Yuppie actually has its root in young urban professional. And what young urban professionals stereotypically were about was making lots of money, you know, uh, 1.8 kids, uh, you know, a couple of BMWs parked in the driveway, expansive, open concept homes, uh, you know, all about uh, keeping an image going, if you will. And this community I worked in, I mean, it was yuppie central. It was the mecca of yuppie mentality. So much so that... Though I worked there for 15 years, Colleen and I actually refused to live there because we just realized we'd never fit in here. <laughs> you know, it'd be hard to make friends with so many in that mentality. But I remember I was talking with this yuppie, and he was like the quintessential yuppie. Probably in his early 30s, made very good money, uh, you know, had literally two BMWs in the driveway, you know, four or 5,000 square foot home in Bay Area. And this was after Bay Area prices had jumped and stuff. But he was in there because his wife was unhappy, and we got to talking about that. And what the wife was particularly unhappy about was his children who were acting out because dad was never around. So I'm thinking idolatry. I'm thinking about disordered love. And I share with him how, you know, unless Jesus is in the central place, you will Look for other things to fill the need in your life. And boy, he erupted, man. He just went off and, and you know, went on this diatribe about, you know, uh, the problem with organized religion. And, and then he gives this one example that, you know, it's organized religion that actually sacrifices children on the altar. And I could never get behind any kind of faith where people do that kind of thing. You know, he's just going on and on and on. And after he had finished, I said, sacrifice their children. Oh, you mean sort of like you have done in preference to your career? Well, then we began to make some progress after that. <laughs> Listen, most of our idols, though they are good, you should know this, that most Christ followers have idols but very few of us actually realize it. And sadly, this breaks my heart. I think the reason why we have idols in part and why we don't even realize it is that from the very beginning of our walk with Christ and moving forward in, in uh, growth in, in Jesus is that we came to faith rather set up for idolatry. I mean, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but... If I did, I'm sure that there would be several that came up that if you came to Christ, weren't raised in a Christian home, came to Christ as a teen or a young adult or something like that, chances are you were sold on this idea that Jesus will give you a better life. We were sold on this idea. Come to Jesus and he'll give you health and wealth. But the gospel was actually never effectively presented to us. It was never shared with us that, listen, God loves you deeply. He has demonstrated his love for you. However, you can't really feel that love or experience that love because of this huge distance that exists between your heavenly father and you because of a condition that the Bible calls sin. That your sin has separated you from this God who loves you. But because he loves you, he's provided a very effective solution. 
You see, our God is a just God, and he has uh, recognized that the penalty of sin needs to be paid, but instead of insisting that you pay it where there'd be no hope for a relationship, he took the penalty upon himself. And that's what his death on the cross was all about, that he bore the payment the obligation of your sin upon himself so that you could be forgiven, so that the slate could be washed clean. Listen, he did that for you. He died for you. And you have an opportunity now to respond and live for him. And you know why you would want to live for him? Because of what he has done. He moved all in. And because of that, You should know this, that the foundation of faith is that Jesus is worthy. It's not about having a better life. We worship him. We follow him. We sacrifice our life for the life he has for us because he's worthy of that. And then guess what? A better life gets thrown in. No question about it. We get a better life. But when what was promoted first was the better life, well, then that's what we're absolutely looking for. And remember, we are like children, and we are impatient. And so when that doesn't seem to be happening, we begin to supplement with these idle activities. So to help you begin identifying maybe where your idol is, some diagnostic questions I would offer for you. Number one, what if you lost it would leave you? I should say what or whom. If you lost it, would leave you, number one, feeling panicky. Oh, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know, just that panicky type of feeling. It's, it's concerned on steroids that I'm talking about here. Deep concern. Uh, uh, yeah, panic. You know what that is. Number two, what or whom, if you lost it, would leave you questioning your own significance, your self-worth your value. If this was gone, honestly, my credentials would go by the wayside. If this was missing, uh, you know, I, um, yeah, I don't think people would even like me. I don't think people would want, welcome me or want me. I don't think people would look up to me. I don't think they would respect me. You know, I'd become either a major loser or a minor loser. Number three, What or whom, if you lost it, would leave you questioning your will to live? And I'm not talking about, you know, full-on suicidal ideation here, but just like, man, I'm not sure if I'd even want to go on living, you know, just Jesus, take me home now type of thing. I want you just to be thinking about what that might be. Whatever that is, that's what the Bible would call an idol, a counterfeit God, a pseudo-salvation, if you will. One more point I want to make this morning before we wrap it up, and that is what you should know about idols is that idols will absolutely break your heart eventually. Jeremiah, whose prophetic words are captured in our Old Testament Bible, Jeremiah uh, was a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah. He was nicknamed the prophet of, anybody know the answer? Yeah, prophet, yeah. Prophet of doom. (laughs) What a nickname, huh? Called by God in 627 BC to be a prophet. And for 40 years, he speak to Judah, doom and gloom about the need to stop with the idolatry. Stop with the rejecting God. Stop with the foreign God worship and all of that kind of stuff. For 40 years, turn back to God, Israel, Judah, or... God is going to deal with you. And 40 years later, that happened. In 587 B.C., Babylon invades Judah, carries most of them off to uh, Babylon in exile for the next 70 years. But long before that event took place, somewhere early on in the 40 years that he was trying to get God's people to quit doing this idolatry thing, he gives this wonderful little illustration that kind of captures the point of how it will break our heart, these idols of ours. This is one of my life verses, by the way, because it is just so relevant to my story as I described as a child and teen. Jeremiah 2, verse 13. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, which is always what idolatry is about. Not forsaken as in gone, gone, and, uh, you know, that uh, just reject Christ altogether, but forsaken in terms of him being the supreme 
uh, the supreme one that we depend on for certainly our dependency needs and for all things that are relevant to you know, our sense of belonging, our sense of acceptance, our sense of competency, that we have forsaken God in that way. And he describes now this God as the fountain of living waters, which is a reference to, this would be essentially a well that was flourished and, and uh, um, filled up by a natural spring. And so he's using an analogy that I, your God, am that spring that the supply of water never runs out. It's fresh, cleansing, healing, refreshing water always available to you. God's saying, hey, I'm that water that you have forsaken. And then he describes the idolatry. He says, and instead you have hewed out or carved out cisterns for themselves. Now, a cistern is different than a well in that, again, wells are kind of spring-filled uh, bodies of water, whereas a cistern in ancient Israel... Limestone was the primary rock of the landscape there. And so what people would do is usually under the house, they would dig out essentially a pool-sized hole in the ground in this limestone rock that would then be contributed to not by an underground spring, but by rainwater. This territory of the world, they get rain six months out of the year, and so it was critical for survival that when it was raining that they capture, preserve, and keep that water. And so they would build a, a system of, of uh, you know, pipes and channels that would take rain off of the roof and bring it down side of the house, under the house, and filling up this cistern. And so he's describing now these idols being like that cistern. And look at the description he gives of these cisterns. We're doing these cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Oftentimes what would happen in the actual literal cistern is that this limestone, generally pretty imp Im impervious, uh, uh, what's that word I'm thinking of, of... Uh, uh, yeah, well anyway, it can... It can it can leak water. <laughs> Porous was the word I was after. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, through, you know, the porous nature of limestone and its potential with shifting ground for it to crack, you know, the, it would just eventually hold no water, which left you high and dry, no pun intended. And so it really, you know, summarizes well this verse, the basics of idolatry, that we forsake God in a, in a meaningful way, and then we turn to these little gods, these idols, these broken cisterns that cannot hold water, that will never satisfy. And so again, whatever it is, that created thing that we turn to to satisfy our needs, it will break our heart. It will always break our heart. Even the secular world has come to recognize this, Living Hope, uh, that without faith in God, people will make up a God to worship and to find fulfillment. Even the secular community is recognizing this, that if we reject the God of Scripture, we will find other things to turn to to get our needs met. For example, Ernest Becker He's a brilliant writer. He won the Pulitzer Prize in 1974 with his book, The Denial of Death. He was an atheist. And he, he did recognize, however, the problem of not believing in God. And throughout this book, The Denial of Death, he addresses the inevitability that if you don't have God, humans will find something else to turn to to turn into a God. And so he writes this. He says, we see how modern people have put themselves into an impossible situation. Modern secular people still need to feel like their lives matter. They need to feel that there is some higher meaning and that they uh, have experienced some kind of a great love, is the term he uses. People still need this, even though, they don't, or, or, even though they're atheists. But, he writes, if there is no longer any God, how are we supposed to do this? Good question. One of the first ways that occurred to the modern person was the, what has been, become known as the romantic solution. So Becker goes on and describes this. The great love, 
that we need in our innermost being, we now look for in the love partner. What is it that we want when we elevate the love partner to this position? Becker answers that. We want to get rid of our faults. <laughs> we want to get rid of our feeling of nothingness. We want redemption and nothing less. We want to be justified to know that our creation was not in vain. And so we turn to our love partner for validation and we expect our love partner to make us good, to make us real through love. I'm like a becker. Why did you reject God, man? I'm like, gosh, you see the problem pretty clearly. Needless to say, human beings can't give you that, Becker writes. No human relationship can bear the burden of godhood. I enjoy reading stuff from atheists, and it's funny. They do an exquisite job of describing the problem, but then reject God's solution to the problems that they so eloquently clarify. Becker is saying exactly what Jeremiah said, that when we forsake God, we'll seek out another God to satisfy. In our day and age, it's not broken cisterns. It's romantic love, which ultimately fails. So that's one example, just romance there as a little God that we have turned to. Another example of how idols will break your heart. Uh, I read this in an article in the New York Times, uh, what happens when exceptional athletes have a career ending injury, could be professional athletes, but it could be Olympiad uh, athletes, uh, collegiate athletes, just anybody who's exceptionally good and that's kind of where they got their stud status in life was through their athleticism. The doctors who treat them say this, and this was what was in the article, that they not only, they being the athletes, not only need physical care and rehabilitation for their injury, they almost always need therapy. Usually depression sets in and it's not physiological. Why? It's simple. The injury sent them into an existential crisis. Who am I? They ask. It's devastating because very often the loss of their, loss of their athleticism has totally wiped out their reason for being. Idols will break your heart. How about this example? This is regarding the idol of fame. Cynthia Heimel, she writes for a popular news weekly uh, called uh, the, the Village Voice, and it's uh, very well read if you lived in Manhattan, New York, uh, not so much away from it, but uh, usually characterized by satire and you know, some interesting articles now and then. And she has a real niche when it comes to the community of Broadway and aspiring Broadway store, uh, stars and the whole theater district of uh, New York City. And in this article, she uh, uh, actually mentions some of the, uh, you know, some of the names that you and I would recognize, uh, who have been, uh, uh, you know, people she's become acquainted with, who were, uh, you know, big names in theater, and she writes this in the Village Voice. Pretty snarky, but <laughs> yeah, uh, I pity celebrities. I really do. Celebrities were once perfectly pleasant human beings but now their wrath is awful. You see, they wanted fame. They worked, they pushed, and the morning after each one of them became famous, they all wanted to take an overdose. <laughs> because that giant thing that they were striving for, that thing that was going to make everything okay, hitting the top in stardom, that was going to make their life bearable, that was going to provide them with fulfillment and happiness. Well, it actually happened, that thing, and the day after, they woke up and they were still them. <laughs> the disillusionment turned them howling and insufferable. <laughs> and she adds this, she says, I think when God wants to play a rotten practical joke on you, he grants you your deepest wish and then giggles merrily when you realize you want to kill yourself. <laughs> Which is unfair. I don't think that that is true, that uh, God, he doesn't uh, giggle merrily. But I tell you what, her statement you know, really harmonizes with the whole point of Romans chapter 1. It's uh, very consistent with Romans chapter 1. 
that the worst thing that God could do to anyone who's choosing to live for career, choosing to live for spouse, children, pleasure, whatever, the worst thing that he could do would be to let that little God become uh, something that he gives to you. Because like the articles here, you would find yourself quite disillusioned, your heart broken. One more example from the secular community. David Foster Wallace voted by Time Magazine among the top 100 most influential writers, not of the year, but of the century. I mean, this guy is huge. He's well known and loved, especially here in the United States, not so much in Europe. He committed suicide in his late 40s. Not too long before his suicide, he gave a commencement address, uh, address at a uh, liberal arts college. And that commencement at address that he gave, it really received uh, quite a bit of attention, almost as much as his books got attention. For two reasons, this particular commencement address got so much attention. First of all, that David Foster Wallace, you know, if you've ever read this guy, this is so true, you know, that he's like most, po mo most postmodern writers, that he's impenetrable, meaning that, you know, you read his books and you really have no idea what he's talking about, you know. <laughs> but this speech happened to be very lucid. I mean, very lucid. You could actually understand what he was talking about. So that got people's attention. And the second reason why it got attention was the uproar in the organized, formal, atheistic community. The content of what he had to say sent them into an uproar. So David Foster Wallace writes in this speech, we still need to feel that our lives matter in the scheme of things. We we still want to merge ourselves with some higher self-absorbing meaning in trust and in gratitude. But we no longer have God, so how do we do this? In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. See where the atheists kind of got their, their dander up over that. No such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice you get is what you're going to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it Jesus Christ, Allah, Yahweh, or just some set of ethical principles, is that pretty much Anything else you, earth, you worship will eat you alive. You remember those words from James? Pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. If you worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. If you worship power, you will end up feeling weak and afraid. And you will ever need more and more power over others just to numb yourself to your own fear. If you worship your intellect for being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about all these forms of worship is that they are unconscious. They are default settings, unconscious default settings. Unconscious part, I agree with that. That's so what I said earlier, you know, that most Christ followers... <clears throat> Most Christ followers have idols, but very few realize. And so in this series, that's what we're going to be taking a look at is jumping into this subject in a more in-depth way. Uh, for now, let me just leave you with a couple of application points. If you're here or if you're watching online and you've never invited Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior, then you are worshiping something as we've discussed today. And whatever that something is, 
in the end, it will never satisfy. And so the good news for you is that God does love you and that you do have a sin problem that separates you from him. And that by turning to Christ and inviting him into your heart and making him your Lord and beginning the lifelong journey of following him, exchanging the life that you set out for in exchange for the life he created you for, Jesus makes all of that possible. But none of that becomes reality until you take the step of inviting him in and choosing him as your true God. And if you begin that journey, well, then you'll be like the rest of us where we now are ironing out the wrinkles for the rest of our days, including ridding ourselves of our tendency towards little gods. But my invitation, whether it's you here today or you watching online, my invitation to you is choose the real God. Bow the knee of your heart to him. Welcome him into your life. I did that when I was 17 years old. I knew better than to be the captain of my life. I knew better. I wanted him to be the captain. And so for you, the application is, will you trade your little God for the true God? If you've already done that and you're here this morning, you are a Christ follower, then I invite you to consider open-mindedly the other gods that are in your heart. I'm quite serious that we all have our struggles with idolatry. We all have our little gods that don't replace God. They just supplement God's slowness to deliver what we need. We all have those. And so all I'm asking of you is to, this week... Give that some consideration. What are the things that, you know, I turn to? And again, you know, those diagnostic questions that we looked at earlier, what makes you feel panicky? If you were to lose it, would your significant self-worth value diminish? Would it at least raise the question of whether or not I even want to go on? You can use those diagnostic questions, but give some consideration to what those roles are, those idols in your life. Chances are, by the way, it will be a good thing, you know. I mean, Colleen and I talk frequently how we're, we're probably guilty of some idolatry in terms of our mutual admiration for one another and delight in one another. I can't say wholeheartedly that if she were to die that I wouldn't feel all of these things, you know. So I'm working, honey, on loving you less, really. No. <laughs> 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 but assuming that it is something good as you open-mindedly consider your little God, you know, money is good, career is good, spouses are good, kids are good, grandkids are good, retirement accounts are good, your health is good. All of these are good, good things. So I'm not asking you Last point of application here. I'm not asking you to get rid of anything good, but I would ask you this, to ask the Holy Spirit what a proper relationship with that person or thing actually looks like. If you've got something that's in the number one or two position and it needs to be down at the three or four position, then I'd like you to talk to the Holy Spirit about that. Listen to him. He will, I promise you he'll have some ideas about what that proper relationship would look like. Father, we want to be a people who serve the Lord God alone because you are one and you share your divine nature with your creation with no other God. And so, Lord, I pray that during these weeks as we study this subject together that you will help us to cut loose our idolatrous ways and we would be a people that with purity and with singleness of mind and heart would worship you and worship you alone because that's where we find life. That's where the springs of living water are realized. Forgive us of our tendency, Lord, to hewn, dig cisterns that are broken, that cannot hold water. Forgive us, Lord, for our tendency to do that. Help us to keep you number one and only you as number one. All God's people said, 
Amen. Stand, living hope.